John Prendergast, welcome to Bridging the Gap, man. We've already had tons of laughs, but uh, now we're recording, so we got to be serious, right? Welcome to the, to the podcast. Oh, hell no. No, that's not happening, man. <laughs> How are you doing, Matt? Good to see you. I'm doing great, man. It's great to see you. Uh, you know, it's... Um, we 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 were being very humble uh, in our pre pre recording here, but oh, yeah. uh, very humble. Um, totally you know, humble. And your your pink light, I love that. Um, <laughs> back in your background, <laughs> my half done studio here. It, yeah, yeah. Hey, I mean, everybody's got their own little way, and you know, we I respect it. I respect. But you know, you had me on on your podcast, the Augman Advisor. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk about maybe AI. We'll talk about everything. Um, and you know, we'll talk about your podcast, which I'm stoked about, which I was so honored to be on. But uh, this is just a fun conversation, man. I think that we're both... Uh, we, we I'll take be the judge of that, Matt, whether this is fun or not. I, I am going to put the fun <laughs> stamp on it right from All the right. beginning, All a right. minute in. The gauntlet is thrown down, man. The it gauntlet is, is thrown down. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, before we get hey, going, let's before this. we get going, man, I, I got one thing. I got to give a shout out to your producer, assistant, person extraordinaire, Shannon, who set this up. I got to tell you, she's the most professional podcast producer, assistant. I'm not sure of her title. I don't have the email up, but awesome to deal with. Like you've got a real gem there. So brilliant. I appreciate that. Yeah, I've done a great job training her. Uh, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> and there goes no. the humble stuff. All right, no, no. let's roll. She, she is, I am the luckiest, I'm the luckiest man to have her working uh, with us because uh, without it, this podcast would not be happening. So uh, I, I'm no uh, no fool to that. So I, I we could, okay. we should spend a whole podcast talking about, I've, I mean, every podcast guest has mentioned how great she is. So I can appreciate that. And thank you for, for calling her out. That's a, that's very kind of you and, and uh, much happy to. And, on her and Shannon, if you're ever looking for another job, I'm just saying, all right, I've got a all podcast. Right, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> what are we doing here? Come on now. This isn't a uh, poaching, poaching solution. This is the <laughs> bridging the gap. Show. All right. All right. This, all right. This, <laughs> uh, well, John, man, um, you know, we've we've had we've had lots of fun talking and connecting, and uh, you know, we know a little bit about each other. And I've got mad respect for for you, my friend. You know, running a technology company, and uh, I know the challenges of that. I had to close mine down, and uh, and and you're you're one that's continued it on. So I, I'm stoked to hear uh, and and dive into that. But before we do, um, you know, I'm always curious to to learn about the individual, and I, I want to know what did the 13 year old John Prendergast want to do when he grew up. That's a great question. Um, okay, first, uh, folks, I was a weird kid. Let, let's just start there. I was, a, I was a weird kid. I had unusual interests. And when I was that age, is it 12, 13, whatever? But when I was that age, my ambition, and I kid you not, literally, I wanted to know everything. I, <laughs> I don't know how I thought that was possible, but I wanted to know everything. And so I was a super curious kid. I dig into everything. Um, you know, and I think that's why I got led into technology because that was the everything at the time. Um, I'm a little older than you, Matt. So, so this is, this is the time, you know, about the Apple two E's coming out. Uh, I was into technology at a Timex Sinclair computer, deep into technology. I just wanted to pull it apart and learn it. Um, finance and business. I remember reading this book, How to Buy Stocks. And so I did. And I actually paid for part of my college through trading. Uh, so yeah. And and everything since has kind of been all over the place. I, I am not consistent. I follow my muse. I love learning. I love knowing about stuff. That's why I loved learning about Benjamin when you were up and running. I thought it was a great idea. You, know, you were early in the market. Um, so, so yeah, I, that was literally my ambition. I wanted to know everything. Didn't it? Didn't work. Just to be clear, it did well, not work. I mean, work. I, I was going to say. I mean, have you? Where where are you on that scale? I mean, from zero to a hundred of knowing everything, where are you at? Uh, so sadly, as you learn more, you learn how little progress you've actually made on that scale. <laughs> it's like the more progress you make, the bigger the scale gets. So uh, yeah, it's it's like being in a fun house where you never get to the end of the. The road, but the the path is really great. I lo I love it. Um, I love diving deep into things uh, that I've never dealt with before. I think podcasting was one of those things for me. Still is. Uh, just yeah, it's so fun to learn something new and to really immerse yourself. Like that's the thing for me. 
yeah. is dive deep and get in and do it. Um, it. Because once you're doing something, you really start to understand it. Uh, so yeah, that was me. I want to I want to dive into that for a second because I'm just curious because I'm a curious person too. Learning is like my my thing. My wife gets mad at me because I like buy all these like little toys and things that I just think are interesting, and she's like, "You only use them for like a week and then you're done." I'm like, "Yeah, but I got like yeah, I, learned I learned something it. from it, and I learned that I didn't like it, and so I'm going to move on." And she gets mad at me because every day we have a new book in front of my door and from my door from Amazon. She's like, that goes on my credit card. And uh, I was like, well, yeah, I know, but it's uh, we're all coming from the same house. Time right to now. shift credit cards and move those <laughs> yeah. books to the Kindle. That's all. Yeah. That's all. That's I all. like the hardbound. I like the hardbound. <laughs> I like to feel the pages and the words in the book. But anyhow, enough about me. This isn't a podcast about me. Um, when you talk about learning, I think learning is something so interesting because I, I that's one of my core values is learning. I love to learn. I have a you know, I love. I'm a curious, a curious human being. I think that some of the best leaders and innovators are just curious in nature. But I, when we talk about learning, everybody says it, but I, I'm always curious of like, what is what is learning? Like, how do you go about you learning? Like, what is that experience or the day in the, the life of, of John Prendergast as he's learning? What does that look like? Is it reading? Is it hands-on? Is it watching YouTube videos? Like, what yeah. what what makes you feel like you learned something new? Uh, and like, what is that process to get you there? Wow, such a great question. Um so a lot of it is serendipitous exploration. Woo, fancy word. Um, <laughs> I need, Shannon, uh, please make a note. We need to look that one up. Yeah. <laughs> and edit it out. No, just teasing. Um, but a lot of it is making time to just explore and follow curiosity. And I think the most interesting people are the most curious people. And, and you have to make time for curiosity, which, man, you know, for this audience that we're talking to, Whoa, that's tough, right? Like uh, running, particularly if you're a solo advisor. If you're running a shop, maybe it's a little easier. But solo advisors are on the hustle like all the time. But I'd still say that in everything, you need time to explore, right? Um, and you just pay attention to the world and you ask yourself why or how and dive in. Um, you know, recently I've been thinking a lot about media and um, the power that it has. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really heavy on YouTube um, and starting to really expand kind of the video aspects of our podcast. So it's, it meant spending hundreds of hours watching YouTube videos, both experts doing it and then other folks who could break some of that stuff down and then applying it, see what worked, see what didn't. So I think it's, it's exploration and then play right? You, you do have to be able to play and apply it. Um, and, and then as you apply it, you get feedback and you get, it gets locked in and hopefully it's moved you forward in whatever, whatever way. Now that cycle could happen in minutes. It could happen in days, months, years, but I think that's it. That's learning for me. Yeah. You know, it, you, it's interesting. You, you said a few things there that were interesting, some that weren't, and that's okay. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always trying to get better. So you, you can give me feedback. It's good. <laughs> this is a 360 review right here. Oh boy. Um, oh boy. And, uh, I don't want to hear it from me though. I, I, I take it too personal. Um, is the, uh, you know, there, there's a few things. And I think that the, the move forward comment and statement is something interesting because I think people take curiosity as like you have moving forward is success. Like something has to be successful. But in reality, failure is you have more data that now you can move forward with that new insight that you didn't have. And that is moving forward. And I know it sounds cliche and they're like, ah, oh, you learn from failure. But like, I mean, take it from me. I mean, we closed down Benjamin. I, I unfortunately had investors who lost over $7 million in yeah. that venture. And, you know, it was a learning experience for all of us. And, um, and some people can say that was failure, but it moved me forward because I know a lot more now than I did prior to that situation. And yeah. I consider that to move forward, even though I don't have that, that business is in a box. It's about this big right up inside of my cabinet here, uh, yeah. of eight years of work. So moving forward is, is something really, I think that's key. And I, I think it's built on what I've been talking a lot about lately, even with my business partners is this experience, experimental mindset. You've got to yeah. have a mind. If you're going to be curious, you've got to have an experimental mindset and go and say, I'm going to do small experiments, learn, and failure helps me learn and moves me forward to finding that solution. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, in in education, they call that the growth mindset, right? So they they do a lot to um, help improve kids' growth mindset so that they are not of a fixed mindset. The, I know what I know and that's it, right? Or I'm good at this and not good at that. It's not true. It turns out we're quite pliable as, as human beings. Um, but I, I think you you are onto something really important as an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, I've been in, this is my fifth startup and second time as founder. And all innovation is dependent on failure. So let me say that again. All innovation is dependent on failure. Not necessarily failure occurring, but um, allowing the possibility of it, taking those risks and, you know, learning how to contain those risks. Now, with a company, it's kind of an all or none bet, right? Um, it, it works or it doesn't. But failing with one project actually makes the person richer and better for that experience mm -hmm. if they allow it to. Yeah. Right? And, and so, and, you know, I've been a part of three startups that didn't work and you do learn every, every single time. And, and the ones that you, that do work, you also fail and learn. It's just the failures weren't catastrophic, right? It's, you failed a little less and, and got to someplace great. I mean, everybody uses the baseball analogy, but if you're a 300 hitter, you're in the hall of fame. Right. And, and that's really true in business as well. But this industry is really tough mm -hmm. on failure mm. for a bunch of different reasons and good ones. Think about it. Right. We're, we're talking about innovating and failure and courage. And here I am managing somebody's money. Whoa, <laughs> hang on. I can't fail at that. So, yeah, th there are places where experimentation and risk make sense and other places where you have to be super cautious. I think. The challenge in this industry is super cautious becomes pervasive and it slows progress in lots of areas of the business because I'm so focused on, I, I can't screw up this money thing with my client. I can't mm. screw up the advice thing. But there are so many other areas of the business where we can be experimenting, learning, moving forward and enjoying it more, right? The more we learn, it, it just expands our view of the world and our view of ourselves and the people I know that are happiest are the most curious. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that you're so spot on on the understanding of the industry. I mean, I, you see it day in and day out with firms that, that you know, are, you're trying to sell your new technology to and help them understand it. And I experience it as well. And, and I think it's not, it's not, it's no fault of, of any individual. It's just the nature of our industry. Our core Absolutely. business, as you mentioned, is to be, we, we get, we don't, we get fired for losing people money. And we need to be very risk averse in that nature. Um, and so that, to your point, becomes pervasive in the other, in the entire industry, which is a yeah. challenge and, and an opportunity, I think. And, you know, I, I think that across the board, not just in wealth management, a lot of leaders of organizations, uh, they say that they, they're innovative. They have an innovative mindset. Yet when you go and, and talk to them, they uh, poo poo when something in that innovative mindset doesn't work because it should all work. And, and, you know, I've been talking to our leadership team that, you know, 80% of our innovations are going to fail, but we're going to yeah. do it on a scale, hopefully that it doesn't impact the core business, but we're going to learn a lot from that because then that's going to lead us to something really innovative. And if we're only winning, we're not innovating. Well, you're we're, not, you're not trying anything, right? Doing. We're tactically yeah. doing, yeah. not innovating. I think the way, the way I think about it is that, um, you can succeed on a test, on a, business proposition, et cetera, or not. And if you don't, <clears throat> the only time you fail is if you haven't set yourself up to learn the maximum amount from that experience, because that's what allows you to improve the next time and get you closer to succeeding, right? So if you fail, but you have no clue why you didn't set yourself up to learn, yeah, there's a lot of wasted resources. I hope the the learning in that is don't do that again. Set yourself up to learn. Yeah, I, I think that that is a um, a really good takeaway. I, I'm curious on your side, and then I want to move into kind of some media because I know you've done a lot with your podcast. I know that you've done a lot with video, like you were mentioning on YouTube, and I want to talk dive into that and how advisors can help with that. Um, but with what can, knowing all of this, what learning is, 
you know, that failure is, uh, you know, acceptance of failure is needed for innovation, which by the way, I'll say that that once I accepted failure and put that on the table with my, with Benjamin in our startup, that was when we had our best years. It was just a little too late because I was running from failure. I was trying not to fail as opposed to accepting failure. Yeah. Um, but now that we know all this and we know that the industry is very risk averse and, and it's, pervasive into the entire organization, how can we as an industry start to kind of unshackle ourselves from that and become a little bit more innovative despite knowing that our core business is a risk-averse business service? Woo! <laughs> Let's, um, go Let's go deep. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I can, I can guess, but... Um, that this is one of those questions that's like a big industry prognostication, which I think are bull. Um, so I, I've got nothing to offer but guesses here. But m my guess is, on the one hand, there is a segment of advisors who are innovating, who are not as um, concerned about the, the risks of innovation and concerned about small failures and are clever about containing um, those kinds of experiments. And I mean, one thing we could do is highlight them, right? As, a, as an industry, talk about these folks who are innovating and not just the successes. Like, I, because that is not the journey, right? The, the journey is all of the failures you didn't see, the 12-year the overnight success, that, that sort of thing. So I think that is, is key. I also think, you know, part of it is continuing to recruit and encourage people who are more open-minded to that um, and more experimental and more creative into the profession. I think, mm -hmm. um, I think that that's key. And look, you know, if you're uber conservative and, you know, you can't get comfortable riding a roller coaster, maybe experimental innovation isn't going to be the thing that you're going to gravitate toward. Maybe you could hire a partner that's a little more open to it and you can find a little detente where you, you get the risks contained and make sure that you're comfortable, but somebody else can help you with the experimentation. So I think there's a lot of different ways. Um, but I, the biggest one for me is changing the narrative and, and exposing the reality of, of failures. I mean, God, I can't tell you how much money I've lit on fire um, in the process of uh, experimenting at Blue Leaf. I just haven't lit so much on fire that we went out of business, right? Um, and that that's really the fuel for for growth and progress. And and I think there there are ways, if advisors are open to it, to, to go after that in a contained way, in a way that can be nice and safe and never endanger your clients. Yeah, I mean, I and I think that the idea of highlighting the failures is so key. I think that there's such an opportunity to talk to people. It's kind of like when you have like a diagnosis, a health diagnosis, and you 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 want to keep it in. You don't want to tell anybody. But then once you tell one person, they're like, oh, I know another person that just had that. And like, I know, wow, like now I feel connected. Now, like, oh, there are other people out there that have taken risks and failed. And it doesn't have to be. And then you feel like this relief. Like this sense of relief. I, I know I had that when I had a health uh, situation about 15 years ago and it was unbelievable. And now it's like open and honest. And I think talking about failures will bring a lot more people to be like, oh, okay, it is okay to do this. And people were able to make it. And I think that there's an opportunity to do more of that uh, because everybody just looks at all the success and is like, well, yeah. if I'm not succeeding and winning and gathering all these assets or doing all this and I'm losing. Right, um, right. And I, I, you know, I wrote 70 pages plus two weeks after I closed down Benjamin and that was all lessons learned. And, uh, it, uh, one day I'll, I'll share maybe if people are interested with more people, but, um, uh, that is what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And you know what? That authenticity is what creates great media speaking into media. And, um, you know, <laughs> um, that segue was, was, was there, but authenticity <laughs> is what is what creates great media. And, and you know, you're very much into media. And I, I'm curious from your standpoint, as you look at media inside of our industry, 
where are the opportunities for advisors to better leverage media to tell their story and create connection? Because this is a human to human business. And so yeah, how can let's yeah. maybe start with how is media able to create that connection? One. And then secondly, how can advisors do better jo- uh, do a better job at, at creating that media? Yeah, it you know, it's amazing, right? Um, if you think about media's impact on your own life, um, think about the television shows that we watch, the um, the relatively famous people who we we like and admire and and in many ways we feel like we get to know as we watch on TV, you know, um, the passing of Charles Osgood from um, Sunday morning on CBS. Um, I, I felt that. And I never met the man. But mm. I listened to him year after year after year um, and felt felt connected to him um, in a way that's really surprising given that you've never met someone. And that all started back when there were, you know, 15 channels on television and that was it. And you had to have big budget and you had to be sort of hired into that job and be a star and and the like. And media is now completely democratized, right? Anyone can get on some form of media. Yes, it's social media, but it is, and that democratization is accelerating. There are more and more people acting as creators, creating um, media, whether we're talking written or audio, like we're doing here, or video. And I think there's something really magic about audio and video in particular um, that makes you feel connected. So, Matt, take your podcast and the listeners that are, are here. They listen to you. I think your show's weekly, so they listen to it every week. I know. You know, I've listened to a bunch of episodes and even if we hadn't met before, I felt like I got to know you because mm-hmm. you were being you in that media. Now you were talking about interesting things to me, but you're, you were talking about them in, from your perspective, in your way, and you brought yourself kind of front and center. And I, I think that's really the power. The best advisors that I've seen do this do exactly that. They they put a part of themselves out there, but more than that, and uh, you had a guest recently, James Canole, mm-hmm. and I thought he was a great example of this, where essentially what they're doing, those, those advisors that are leveraging media well, is they are showing a bit of their client experience. Here's what it's like to be my client. Here's how I talk to you if if you're a client here's the kind of advice i give here's the 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 ways that we work but in a more compelling way than showing you a pdf and over time the folks who tune into that that vibe to to use the kids lingo that vibe with james right they're great fit prospects because they already feel like they know him they already feel like they know what he offers. And in that podcast, he actually talked about the way that that acts as kind of a magic filtering mechanism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And especially with solo advisors, the differentiator in your practice, strip away all the BS, the differentiator in your practice is you. It's you. Okay, how do you articulate that on a web page, or just at a seminar, how do you articulate it in a way to get people to your, your event, right? Your dinner <laughs> or your seminar or what have you. Um, you've got to be you. You've, you've mm-hmm. got to show up and let people in, let them know you because that's what they're really buying at the end of the day. Um, and especially for solar protect- practitioners. I, I mean, I think that that is, I always say the moat in our industry is not your investment philosophy. I mean, I know that you sell technology. I used to sell tech- it's really not even actually technology. It's you. The, nope. the moat in our industry, the reason that we will never be overtaken by technology is because it's a relationship business and they, nobody can replicate you. I love uh, in the Almanac of Nav- Naval, he, he has this concept that he talks about where if the inputs and the outputs are predictable, where I can say, if I put this in and that's output, that, that creates, that is not differentiation that is commoditization yeah, basically right yeah. there's if if i do this and i do that then i get x or y 
that's not differentiation. But when, when the inputs and the outputs have an inverse correlation or a under, un, lack of clarity, right, uh, in terms of that, that's called creativity. That's authenticity. That's differentiation. Right. And I, I feel that we're in this world, in this environment, that we're all looking for that, that silver bullet. Even though we're advisors and we tell our clients that you can't get in investments, we're looking at it in marketing like, okay, well, if I go and write in this style or put this type of video yeah. out on YouTube or on LinkedIn yeah. that I'm going – like I go and I follow this marketing guru and they tell me to do it. And all I say to them – and I'm actually writing a, uh, an email blog on this that will come out in a few weeks – is that they're not, you're, you're not going to win. You're just going to be in the sea of noise. If you want to win, yeah. if you want to win, just be you. And you know what? Some people listen to this podcast and they just don't like me. And that's okay. That's okay. That they means I'm doing something out. right. <laughs> they may have tuned out if they don't like you, man. <laughs> that, that means I'm doing something right because I'm not going to, I'm attracting the people that are attracted to who I am. And I, I can only be someone else for so long and I'll never be as good as they are being them at all. And so you just need right. to be you. And I, I fear that advisors struggle with that because they're like, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it because I have this professional yeah. persona and we just got to help them get through that. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to help them get through that yeah. because that's important. I would look, here's the thing. Talk to the microphone, talk to the camera, like a client. Um, in fact, one, one trick Right. If you're if you're struggling doing media, do this. Ready? This is this is worth everything for this episode. All you need to do is set yourself up like Matt and I here in a in an interview, in a dialogue. It can be one of your people at work. Record it. Record your conversation. Have them ask you clients that yeah, have them ask you questions that clients would. And you just respond into the camera into the microphone. You will be you. Not only will you be you, but you'll be you doing the thing that you do. And you'll be doing it in a way that you've opened up and are able to show your prospective clients what you're really about. No persona, just who you are. If, so look at what I've got on, right? I don't have a sport coat on, right? It's like heretical in the in the industry. <laughs> oh my God, no sport coat, what's going on? But I think uh, if you wear a sport coat, hell, if you wear a bro bow tie, wear the damn bow tie, that's great. If you don't, then don't. Be who you are and have a real, honest, authentic dialogue and just record it. There's a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, super famous in the social media world. And what he says about content creation is document don't create. And that's what I love about what James Canole, your prior guest, talked about and what many other folks are doing. They're documenting what they really do. They're just putting a camera or microphone in the way and just doing it. Yeah. And that really connects with your people, the people you're really built for. Yeah. Um, so that that's what I would say. And find that medium that works for you. Maybe video doesn't work. Maybe audio doesn't work. But maybe writing does, and you're you're able to express Absolutely. yourself in writing more easily. And I, I, I think about you know a lot of the challenge. I've talked with a lot of people that have tried to do podcasting and video, and when they when they get in front of the camera, they like freeze up. When I turn the camera off, we have a great dialogue. And the reason is that there's this great. I'm a big golfer, and there's this big, uh, great sports psychologist named Bob Rotella. And uh, he helps all the, the great players with putting and golf. And like, I've read a lot of his books and basically he's like that what he tells the great players, this is, he gets paid millions of dollars to sell, to tell them this, by the way, he says, uh, don't think that's it. Don't think he's like, that's literally what he tells them. It's like, you're thinking about it way too much. And you know, you think about like when I'm playing golf and I'm in like a match and I'm behind, when I start thinking about how much I need to do or have my three down or whatever it may be. I then have to, I then put so much pressure on every single yeah. swing that I'm overthinking it. And you know what? The next thing I know I'm five down, but when I'm just like there and I'm like, you know what? I, I played like yeah. dog poo this whole time, but I'm just going to swing and hit this one and see where it goes. That's like, there you go. And then all of a sudden I'm a one down and you just take these like small strides. So you can't think about all the people that are going to look at you. And as human beings, we worry about acceptance. And so we we fear not being accepted and saying yeah. something that will that will be detrimental um, to our business, to our lives, whatever yeah. it may be. And the reality is, is that you will do that 
when you think about it. You likely won't when you're just your own self. And that's I, getting that through is hard. Yeah, and so one of the reasons I do podcasts is because I've tried the, and I'm just grabbing for a phone, I've tried the look into your phone and record a video. I sound like a moron, right? I, I either sound like Crazy Eddie trying to sell a stereo or, <laughs> <laughs> or I sound like I'm about to fall asleep. And I, I, I'm amazed at how difficult that is. But when I'm talking to you, I, yeah, I can just do me. And I think part of it is looping back to what you said earlier. If you're a good writer, great, do that. If you're good on audio, but not, you don't feel comfortable on video, do that. Absolutely. Part of this is manipulating the situation to your strengths and teeing that up, to use another golf analogy. By the way, you made me think of a quote from the movie of Bagger Vance, right? Where, where the advice from Bagger Vance was he needed to learn how to stop thinking without falling asleep. I love that. <laughs> It's the truth, though. And I mean, it's in everything in life, right? The more we think about something, the less likely it's going to come true, right? Or happen, right? The Absolutely. moment everybody, I always think about it. I mean, I was never, uh, you know, a ladies man in high school or, or college. But and every time I was like thinking about wanting a girlfriend, it never happened. The moment I, you know, that's what I always say. When you've got a girlfriend, you're not thinking about another girlfriend. Yeah. All the girls want to fall in love with you. Why? Because you're not thinking about it. It's the same exactly. thing. It's the same thing here. Though, you know, I think... When, if you're an advisor sitting here listening and about to tune out because they're like, oh my God, they're talking about media. I don't want to, be, I don't want to do any of this. I, I would say consider this. Media is not only your greatest opportunity to reach more people. And I'd say heretically from a technology CEO, there's more leverage in media than there is in technology. And the two together is super powerful. But think about this. There is more media competing for your client's attention your current clients, as well as your, you know, potential prospects' attention than ever before. And it's going faster and faster. And this is not just broadcast media, CNBC, which, let's face it, Jim Cramer honking a horn, how many client headaches has that caused for you? Because I'm sure it's a few. But it's beyond that. And if you think about social media, even grandmas on TikTok and Facebook and knows how to Zoom now because of the pandemic, everything's changed. And speaking of TikTok, TikTok got to a billion users in under five years. It took Facebook eight. That was the previous fastest growing platform in the world. So everything's going a little bit faster. Everything's fighting for your client's attention more and more and more. Media, even if it's not marketing media, but think about the way you communicate with your clients. Broadcast, right? Not just one-on-one. -on -one. Media... If you think about that as a channel, you to your clients, and you think about how am I going to optimize my channel to my clients and my communication to my clients, you have to think about the context they're in. You have to learn how to break through all of the other noise, which is why it fascinates me that many traditional advisors still only really send a quarterly report to their clients four times a year, schedule a call once or twice a year. And then it's the market newsletter, and they're expecting that to do the heavy lifting of breaking through all the noise and CNBC and CNN and MSNBC and Fox and never mind TikTok, Facebook, you name it, right? Yeah. You got to get in the game. And that for me is the biggest thing about media, right? It's, it's a communication medium. It is broadcast. But the beauty of audio and video and a guy – named Brendan Kane, who helped Taylor Swift with her media stuff, said the one thing he learned from Taylor Swift, and this, advisors, is the one thing you can learn from Taylor Swift also, is that social media, and really all media, isn't broadcast. It's one-to-one. -one. It's me talking to you. And, and if you think about it in that way, that means you can do that, me talking to you, for each of your clients. Even if the message isn't completely customized to your clients, if it's from you, it becomes customized because it's you. You're the through line. You're the differentiator, going back to that earlier point. Yeah, and you know, you said if people are getting bored because we're talking about media. I mean, I, I'm biased, but I don't think this is boring at all. I think this is so much gold. Everybody talks about about growth being their challenge. And, and the thing right. I think that, that frustrates advisors about um, media, and this is going to migrate us into, I think, technology, is the ROI on it, 
right? It media successful media is about consistency. It's yeah. not one thing's going to blow up your pipeline and allow you to have this like flood of people. It's the consistency of it because people aren't going to see it the first time. It's like you have to say things a thousand times for it to be heard. They, they're not going to see it the first time. You know, like on the 300th podcast, I'm going to have more followers than I did on the 100th. But if I stopped at 100, I never would have gotten to 300. But they see me every single week, whether they like it or not, they see me. And I, I think that that is the challenge. But it's hard because you're not getting immediate gratification. And it makes yeah. you feel like you're wasting time because you don't yeah. know, you've never been to that other side before. And I, I just encourage yeah. people, just like you tell people in retirement, like to get to retirement, like, trust me, you will be okay. You've done a great job. Clients still tell you, no, I'm not. I'm going to run out of money. You're like, no, I've seen this like hundreds of times. I'm trying to yeah. tell people that I've seen this hundreds of times too. Just stay consistent. And that's going to be your best currency to success with media. Yeah, I, I think that's right. But I think that's a broader issue with marketing in general. You know, we get into the measurability of marketing. Um, you know, one of the big promises of digital marketing was measurability. And that turned out to be, you know, bull crap, like no way. Um, it's because of attribution. It's really difficult. And in this world that we're in right now, with the media cycles going so much faster, social media being so omnipresent, um, audience, right, is and is really critical. It attention is really the number one asset for any business. Do I have my customers, my clients' attention? That's what everything in the current world is fighting for. And if you're going to do your job especially when your clients aren't directly in front of you, then it's about you having your share of their attention so you can deliver value and remind them that you're delivering value all the time in the background. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's uber critical. It really is. Attention is the number one asset. And it's being day traded by all of these other platforms. And for me, I feel like you got to get in the game just to be defensive, even if you don't want to grow like and be a YouTuber, like that. No one's talking about that. An audience of a thousand people can make a business, no question. A thousand raving fans. It's a great old article about this and the value of an audience, and it's proven out over and over and over again. And what I'm saying is, think about communication and who you are as this through line. That's your marketing plan. That's your client service plan. That's, that's your brand plan, communication, right? All of it is, is a single kind of continuum of how I communicate with the world. Some of those members of the world happen to be the clients that are already paying me. Some of them are the folks who haven't yet started to work with me and pay me. But I want to communicate nonetheless across that whole spectrum. Yeah, I think that, you know, you said a thousand raving fans is better than 10,000 followers, right? Because if mm -hmm. they're not interested, then it doesn't matter. But if you have a thousand raving fans, when you ask yeah. them for something, they're going to they're gonna listen and they're going to believe you. Uh, and that will turn into a thousand and one and a thousand and two. And that's how you build right. it. I, and, and I think that there's this, and I want to talk about before, I, I want to be cognizant of time. And I, the last real topic I want to talk on, you know, we've talked about media and content and you're a technology CEO, but I think it's so powerful because it's so necessary to get you uh, utilization out of your technology. But a lot of people say, well, I don't even know what to talk about. I don't even know what to start. But that then leads into the opportunity that technology has now provided, especially with artificial intelligence yeah. and AI. Everybody says, I'm tired of hearing it, but I'm going to keep talking about it because I do think that it will reshape how we do it. I don't think it'll be like this like moment in time, but I think we'll just gradually adopt it. I'm curious on your perspective of, of artificial intelligence and AI and from your technology lens and your seat as a CEO of a technology company, where does, AI, where does AI fit, if at all, into the world of wealth management going forward? I, I mean, it's fairly pervasive in the way that it's going to impact the world, right? <clears throat> wealth and wealth management isn't unique in that respect. Um, and what's going to happen is <clears throat> our industry is not going to change that much in the relatively short term. But over the longer term, it's going to likely change more than any of us can possibly imagine and in ways that are really hard to foresee. But what I'm observing right now is that the advisory firms that are leveraging AI in a smart way and in a safe way are seeing that they're accelerating. It could be that they're leveraging it to generate more and more marketing content. Now, going back to this idea of authenticity, it's not let me have chat GPT write my blog post for, for me. 
those are crap. They're awful. And part of it is re refer to the your your differentiator. So the ideas still have to come from you, but AI can accelerate it dramatically, really, really, really fast. And I think that's its key benefit. It can summarize things, make things faster and easier, but you're the editor. You're the one coming up with the ideas, but it can make you more you. Even mm. in, in, in other realms, other than text generation, there's a ton of ways that you can use AI to accelerate. Hey, so let me give you an example. I, one I just did myself. Uh, I needed m new photos and I, I didn't have time or energy to go do a photo shoot. So I went and I was doing that YouTube research I was mentioning, trying to understand, okay, how do I make my podcast do a little bit better on YouTube, et cetera, and stumbled into, stumbled into, stumbled into, and learned about a, an AI tool that can basically do headshots for you. You hand it, you know, 25 or more photos of you over time in various outfits, and it can basically put you in any outfit in any situation, give you a new, whole new set of headshots. If you look at my profile shot on LinkedIn right now, it, it was never a photo that was taken. It was AI. And that was happened in seconds. Like I, I took a few minutes to upload and bam, instead of a, an hour or two to go do it. And I think everything that we do in marketing and communications is going to get accelerated that way. People also think about, well, advice. What about a chatbot advising? I don't know, chatbot's not you. It's not human, right? Go back to the brand. And the reason why I think media is so critical is because anything that isn't you is likely to be commoditized and, and automated. Um, trading and rebalancing. I mean, that's already pretty automated for most folks. Um, AI stock picking. Eh, I mean, we've had algorithmic stuff for a long time. I'm not sure that's really the thing. Um, but I think really more than anything, it's an accelerant to mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And you got to get used to the pace and buckle up. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with it. It's not going to replace the human, but you think about, can you have a chatbot that allows for questions that only advisors could answer because of their skill set? Could you maybe now trickle that down to other team members to free up advisors to serve more families using a knowledge center and an AI chatbot or GPT that is able to answer those? And are you able to then better understand how your clients are going to react to certain headlines and stories based on using their information in a secure way? I think security is the biggest thing that needs to happen to allow it to continue to, to yeah. proliferate even more. The, the last question I'm going to ask before I ask my two final questions. I mean, John, we're going to have to have you back because I think we could talk for hours. Uh, I mean, we may just have to create like the, the a new Tim Ferriss style podcast, just me and you, and we'll talk for five hours a podcast. Um, All right. And um, really I'm bore in. the heck out of people. And really bore <laughs> the heck out of people. Um, no, Tim Ferriss does not bore us, bore me, but you would, me and you would. Uh, the, uh, is So, I, I, you know, Chain, getting advisors to adopt new technology, to make shifts in technology, speaking of AI and adopting AI, you know, it's an industry that's really tough. We experienced that with Benjamin because it was a new type of technology and there wasn't right. really a need yeah. to change. There wasn't, and it wasn't like selling against something else and say, I have better like widgets than the other firm. And a lot of advisors are risk averse. And we were talking about it earlier on the podcast yeah. for innovation because there is no need to change. There is no threat existential threat to the to to them yeah there's these perceived threats that we can build the headlines that if you don't go after the next gen you're going to be there if you're if you don't take digital everybody wants digital and your clients are going to leave you but they haven't yet seen that they haven't yet right, seen that right. and in reality i could just stay as an advisor and manage 100 million and not do anything just serve those people and in 10 years that'll be 200 million and not this is a beautiful thing about the industry is that yeah. i double my revenue and my income, and I've done nothing else in terms of growth. So yeah. what is going to be that impetus to cause advisors to be more innovative, adopt new technologies, change technologies, adjust the way that they've done business? Or is it not going to happen? It's always just going to be on the edges. Ooh, that one, <laughs> that, that for a tech CEO is like an existential question. Um, but I think your listeners deserve real <clears throat> and so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you stuff that other tech CEOs maybe wouldn't. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm gonna channel my inner Aaron, Aaron Klein here. And but um, here's the deal: um, there are no wholesale transformations that happen in the short run in any industry, really, but in particular in this industry. And 
the back office software doesn't isn't easily ripped and replaced. Um, and so honestly, it, across most of this industry, in most categories of software, change is slow. New categories can emerge and people will try those things because they're bolted on. They're not a replacement. Repl you know, change is hard if, if you have one thing and you, you're going to go do another. Super hard. Um, so I think what you will see, you'll continue to see is really changes around the margins, uh, new advisors kind of bringing new technology along with them. And the technology changes tend to be sort of, you know, sub-generational, right? They're not, uh, in two years, you know, we all have a different CRM. No, not, not how it works. In a decade or two, you'll go from, you know, Wealthbox not being a, a, a player really, being brand new, to having leading market share. But that takes two decades in this industry. And so if you're a tech player hoping for a quick hit, look elsewhere. Um, and th now that isn't to say that there aren't lots of opportunities for incremental improvement in the industry. And I think we do see that and we see that a lot. And we're thinking, you know, at Blue Leaf, we're thinking about how do we leverage this advantage in high client engagement to offer something that can be more easily bolted on to other things. Um, rather than getting this rip and replace game. We got a lot coming on that front. Uh, but I think, you know, I look at Asset Map, a uh, great tool, kind of a new kind of category, right? It can coexist and does coexist with a lot of traditional financial planning. Um, and, and I think you'll see a, a lot more things like that continue to roll out. And, you know, just trying to rip and replace, if you're not 10x better, why would anyone bother, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it's a tough, tough game to try and get me. Uh, it's a difficult game to get people to change. And that's true for advisors selling to clients who are trying to rip them away from another advisor. Unless they're already thinking, I want to go, that, you know, you're better off in most cases looking at somebody else or maybe getting a piece or something like that. So I don't think there's rapid change on the horizon. Um, but I do think there's a big change on the horizon. I think Altruist um, and, uh, you know, somebody I know really well started that and he's fabulous. And I think that kind of a platform is going to make a big change over the long haul, but it will take a long time for that to materialize. Yeah, it's a long game. I love that answer and I love that vulnerability. Um, and to be the cognizant of time, I'm going to, I've got two questions I like to ask everybody. And like I said, we're going to have to have you back on because there's so much we didn't even get to. Uh, I'm going to do, we're going to do rapid fire here. All with right. These last two questions. Rapid right? fire. Lightning Let's round, go. Rapid fire. All right. So I love to learn from others that are smarter than me like yourself. And I love to do that via reading. So I ask every guest, what's one book out there that you think everybody should read or reread if they've already read it once? Easy peasy. It's how to tell a story. And it's from the folks at the Moth Radio Hour on NPR. And if you don't know the Moth, what they do is they get regular folks to get up and tell a story from memory that's 11, 12 minutes long up on stage. And then that gets recorded. This is a book written by all the producers who teach and educate them how to do that. And the reason I think this is so powerful is because we all learn through story. And just taking that message that we want to deliver and forming it into a coherent story helps people remember it, helps us stand out. It's really how humans have communicated since cave paintings. And they are amazing. And what I'd really recommend is the audio version because you get to hear the storytellers and the different producers participate in the feedback and the various ways that this all works out. It's fabulous. I love that. I love that. That's a great one. Now, last question. We talked about a lot here. Uh, what's one piece of actionable advice that you think that people can take and implement today or tomorrow to better themselves, their firm, or whatever it may be from, from topics we talked about today? Yeah. So I actually have two. One is um, accelerate your communication. We talked about media, but that isn't the thing. The thing is communication. And you need to communicate far more, far more often than you ever have before and in far more mediums to be successful at connecting and engaging your clients. 
Um, Blue Leaf automates that for our, our folks, but there's a lot of ways to do this that you can do on your own. And whatever way you do this, accelerate the frequency of your communication with clients and the relevance, et, et cetera. The, the other thing is this quote. Shannon had asked me about this. Uh, like, what's, in, what's a quote that's kind of kept you inspired? It, it's on this theme. And uh, I'll leave all you with this. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. It's over my shoulder right here. Get going. Do something. Don't think. Do. That's what matters, right? How you do things. The other thing I love about this quote is it's always attributed to Goethe. And if you do any research, actually Goethe never said this. It was some Scottish mountaineer that referenced this quote as and attributed it to Goethe. Yeah, crazy. But it's a great quote. Love that. Just do, just go, just start right as the Nike logo, just do it and just go. Um, well, this is John, this has been incredible, man. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation, the vulnerability, the depth of it, the fun. It was a lot of, you know, some side jokes that maybe were, were not fully, uh, explained to the listeners, <laughs> but thanks for letting us do it. And, uh, uh, I know that people are going to want to continue to follow you, follow your journey, follow Blue Leaf, follow everything. So what's the best way for people to stay in touch with you, follow you, and yeah. get in touch with you? Yeah, it's, so great question. Thank you. So we're on YouTube. Uh, we've got two channels um, at uh, at Augmented Advisor. That's our main podcast. Uh, and at Blue Leaf Advisor. So that is uh, the company. And then you can also follow me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's just you know, John Prendergast is my LinkedIn handle and uh, a lot of company information will will flow through me or you can always follow Blue Leaf on LinkedIn. Love that. And you'll be able to go to LinkedIn and see John's AI profile pic. It Absolutely. Looks great. It looks really good. Uh, but John, man, I just appreciate what you're doing for the industry, man. You're, you're helping to make change and impactful change, positive change. And I appreciate that from uh, being in the industry. And uh, thank you for taking some time out of your day to spend it with us here on Bridging the Gap. And uh, I hope to have you back here soon to so stay well, be well. And thank you again, my friend. All right. Thank you.